Hello? Filter? Filter? Yeah. Dear all, thank you very much for uh, joining us and welcome to the second week of uh, our World Heritage 2021 debates and the thematic months dedicated to impacts of disaster and pandemics on World Heritage sites. I am Umberto Bonomo, I am an architect in uh, Santiago de Chile, director of the Cultural Heritage Center at the Catholic University and convener of One World Seminar, together with Fernando Perez, Karen Gole, Yolanda Muñoz and Hilter Gonzalez. And we plan this seminar to celebrate profound knowledge accumulated on how pandemics and social natural disaster have affected and continue to affect our world heritage. Our speaker uh, will kindly share the, their case studies, experiences and lessons to allow us creating a vision um, about the state of health or disease of our world heritage. Throughout this month, and now we are uh, starting the second week, we organized more than, than 20 seminars and conversation, a very um, collective effort of more than 100 people, some of which from the most remote areas of the globe. Along with uh, thanking all the people who have made this possible, I would like also uh, to thank all the coordinators of each of the sessions and the presenters who will accompany us throughout this month. Uh, for those who don't know um, the Our World Heritage Foundation, it seems relevant to me to recall our aims. The purpose of the foundation is to promote heritage protection, conservation and management, to support knowledge-based decision-making, to promote good governance of the World Heritage Convention and to engage and empower civil society in heritage protection and management. I mean, saying this, um, I now introduce the, the, this month uh, the, a small, with a small video that we prepare for you. Recent disasters and an actual pandemic have exposed the fragility and vulnerability of our world heritage. These exceptional sites and pieces, which we would like to preserve for all humanity and future generations, do not exist in a segregated world. They belong to our social environment and our daily life. But at the same time, the world heritage sites are in danger. They are threatened by natural hazards that attempt against their existence. The pandemic has revealed their fragility and how much the human presence in them is vital and necessary for their survival. How can we protect them and at the same time give them life and new meanings? If we hope for a future for them, we should stop considering them only as beautiful objects or places, merchandise for the tourist industry, and fully integrate them into the social and cultural dynamics of daily life. We propose to promote a great discussion around the world on the risks and effects of disasters and pandemics on World Heritage Sites. We invite non-governmental organizations, academies, representatives of civil society and local governments to participate, to contribute with new proposals for public policies on the conservation and safeguarding of the cultural and natural heritage of humanity. And then uh, today's session is called uh, Preparing for Emergency to Ensure Resilience uh, of Cultural and Natural Heritage System Under Threat, a Matter of Good Territorial Governance. The, the host 
and the moderator of this uh, and the organizer of this session is Claudio Cimino. Uh, Claudio is master and postgraduate in architecture at La Sapienza. Since 1984, is member at the board of architects of Rome. In 2005, co-founded an architect's firm. Uh, after a decade spent doing research in Latin America and coordinating development project in the Middle East with the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, designing, managed, and monitored a project in over 40 countries in Africa, Asia, Europe, and Latin America, focus, focusing on urban regional planning, cultural heritage restoration and conservation, art and craft, and industrial design. During this, uh, the last 15 years was increasingly engaged in uh, the study and the development of progressive risk uh, preparedness, mitigation and response measure to protect cultural heritage as a key to good territorial governance. Uh, is a senior scholar, lectures uh, on cultural heritage management in several Italian and European university, is a member of the surprise, uh, supervising committee and a lecturer within the uh, H 2020 uh, master in uh, uh, in La Sapienza. Thank you, Claudio. You have the floor now. You are muted. Thank you, Umberto. Thank you very much. Um, since the presentation was very long, actually. So, I mean, um, we pass directly to introduce this session. Uh, as a cultural and natural heritage are among the highest expression of humanity, however, we assist to a sharp increase of disasters causing severe damage or loss of heritage worldwide, as we saw from the video. Countries affected by catastrophic events are usually caught unprepared and capable to deploy mitigation and or response measures. But finally, what does it take to be ready to protect heritage at risk? Which disaster risk reduction policies currently in place are considered a good practice, if ever? Which private public partnership can responsible state agency establish to ensure cultural or natural heritage protection? These are several, these and several other questions should be finding an answer within this session together with some options and proposals. In other words, we pose questions that are legitimate and obvious, but the obvious questions are hard to come up. So what we did today, we invited uh, a number of experts from uh, several continents to testify the exp their experience on major catastrophic events so we are not talking uh, little things, we are talking major catastrophes and see what sort of experience they developed. To pass quickly, I would uh, start with the first speaker that is Professor Adelantia Maratunga. Uh, she is uh, definitely an expert. I met Adelanti very recently, but I, I have uh, been very impressed. She has a long, long experience in disaster risk reduction and uh, she teaches at the at the university in uh, in the uk at the university of huddersfield and uh, she leads the global disaster resilience center there in uh, the uk she joins the european commission and unit cedra in the united nations disaster risk reduction agency at the european sciences and technology advisory group representing the uk and uh, she is leading in several other matters, a very long li uh, list of uh, achievement. So Dilanti, please testify your experience in Oceania and the region of the Pacific Ocean, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claudio. Thank you very much. Uh, um, so uh, can I um, share my screen? Uh, it says the host uh, disabled. Can, can... Now you can, Dilanti. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes.
Okay, so first of all, uh, let me thank uh, Claudio for uh, inviting me to uh, uh, to speak at this uh, very uh, important event. And um, as he said, I'm actually looking in the uh, disaster risk reduction perspective into cultural heritage. I hope uh, that it, it will be useful for uh, this uh, this particular um, uh, audience. So, of course, I'm coming from a Global Disaster Resilience Center at University of Huddersfield. I'm not going to actually uh, invest more time on that. Um, of course, I will, I will share the slides. So my uh, short talk today, what I'm going to talk about today is actually uh, uh, just to give an outline about cultural heritage sites at risk. Uh, and and then to briefly answer why we should uh, 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 we should actually uh, the, the site managers of world heritage site, sites need to be concerned about DRR, uh, and also I'm going to actually then bring in a kind of a, a major case study uh, after the uh, the tsunami, the impact of Indian Ocean tsunami uh, on on Asia's uh, uh, particularly the Sri Lankan cultural heritage, and I will share some. Uh, uh, a case study. And with that case study, I will share some of the issues that had to be dealt with. And also, uh, again, learning points, what, what are the key principles of DRR that can be applied to heritage. So that is actually the, the brief, uh, brief uh, case study. Um, so so I, I, I do not know how, how much time I have. Uh, Claudio, how much time do I have? 10 minutes. All right. Okay. So I'll I'll try to uh, uh, rush through. Uh, again, you know, perhaps then maybe I do not need to emphasize uh, the the importance of uh, cultural heritage sites, particularly with the uh, with the urban uh, the increasing in urbanization and and so on and so forth. The cultural sites are very much exposed to disasters in 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 today's uh, time scales, and all, of course I can give you so many examples. For example, getting back to Nepal, two thousand and fifteen, and also China, two thousand and 13 and 14, and most recently in Indonesia, the coast of Indonesia, uh, there have been sort of major hazards and they have actually sort of led to, uh, uh, they have demonstrated the extent to which the cultural heritage is highly vulnerable uh, to the impacts of, of these natural um, hazards. So the key factor indicating the need to increase the disaster resilience of heritage sites is the fragility of their historic fabric and higher vulnerability. I think that is the key point that we, we need to uh, remember. But also it can be due to aging materials, limited critical infrastructure and urban density. So there can be a lot of reasons behind why uh, cultural heritage sites are more vulnerable to disasters. So in that sense, I suppose it is increasingly being recognized. Again, the, the same reason why this major event has a topic in this area is actually that it is it is really important that proactive measures are undertaken to reduce risk to cultural heritage. So that is actually the main basis or the purpose of having this session. And also in doing so, it is really important that major underlying causes need to be recognized for their increasing vulnerability. So that needs to, uh, needs to happen. But again, I think uh, an alarming point that we need to remember and recognize and perhaps why this type of dialogue is really important is the, uh, the potential absence of any comprehensive legal framework for protection of cultural heritage against disasters. Uh, again, it is directly linked to the topic of this conversation on, on, uh, on, uh, about DRR governance and the, and the cultural uh, heritage. So uh, very briefly, why should uh, World Heritage Site managers be concerned with DRR? Again, you know, the key points, are, uh, I'm not going to actually go through all the points in detail, but I'm very happy to share the, uh, share the slides. For example, I think we all need to understand the disasters cannot be entirely prevented, but mitigation measures can effectively reduce the risk. That is the core. That is the core message that I want to uh, emphasize. And also with that, I suppose, I think under the World Heritage Con Convention, the countries have signed up to obligation to pre preserving world heritage properties for future generations. So both go hand in hand. That, uh, uh, the, the, that uh, 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 major position with the World Heritage, uh, Heritage Convention with the need to have proactive measures to prevent disasters. But again, 
linking with that, the disasters can have great financial consequences. So we shouldn't actually, uh, we shouldn't actually forget that. In that sense, it is, it is, uh, it is uh, highly recommended that we actually think about cost-effective investment rather than being preventative risk management planning. So that is actually again, which is very valid for cultural heritage examples um, also. So if I sort of quickly go to the uh, case study that I want to cover. So the, the case study is actually sort of the, uh, in, in, in uh, Southern Asia, it's, it's the island of Sri Lanka. You can actually sort of see in the map where it, it, it locates. So it is an island uh, of, of 65,000 uh, uh, kilometers, uh, but it, it has diverse climate, biological, ecological, social, cultural resources. Uh, and also irrespective of the size of the country, it has very large number of uh, uh, cultural world heritage and uh, and natural world heritage sites. So that is actually uh, quite an important point to um, uh, point to emphasize. So if you sort of go back to the tsunami, Indian Ocean tsunami on Sri Lanka, again, it is not my intention to uh, talk, uh, talk a lot about it, but you can see uh, from the map to your left, uh, the, the entire country, the coastal region was, was devastated by, the, by the, uh, the tsunami. So you can actually sort of see one, uh, the, the top uh, left-hand corner picture is actually the major road. So you can see how it was covered by the, by the sea water. So in that sense, I suppose uh, uh, um, uh, the, the causes for tsunami and the scale of the humanity, tra human tragedy that ensued now well, uh, well known as a result of extensive media coverage. We know, we have heard enough about it, but what is actually less known is actually the impact it had on cultural property. That is actually the, the, the basis of this, of this uh, case study. So in that sense, I suppose uh, in, in Sri Lanka, actually they experienced a lot of difficulties in trying to save some of its historical buildings affected by the uh, Indian Ocean um, tsunami. So I suppose this is actually one of the key examples I would like to show one of the UNESCO heritage uh, sites and, and particularly in, 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 in the maritime, maritime uh, coastal uh, province. And, and the uh, history of that is, I suppose, due to the strategic position of the country, you can see it is actually, the, the, with the location, it was actually uh, attracted by a lot of sailors going back to 15th century, 16th century, the Portuguese, the Dutch and then the uh, English. So this legacy actually includes some of the oldest historic buildings in this country. So you can actually see to see the, the bottom picture that is actually a, a kind of a fort that was built uh, in, in the maritime uh, region that which was heavily affected by, by the tsunami. So these are some of the pictures from, uh, fr from after the damage of the tsunami. So you can actually see, to see from, the, uh, from the first picture to your left, the, the damage that uh, uh, tsunami caused to this particular heritage uh, size, site. Even though in that sense, even though large number of host community perished in the tsunami devastation. Some of the monuments, they survived. As you can see, they, they weren't actually fully damaged, but to considerable extent they were they were damaged so in that sense i suppose uh, some of the issues that was actually identified as uh, as major issues in in preventing cultural heritage sites in sri lanka from drr perspective within this case study, the number one point I want to emphasize is, is lack of capacity and lack of capacity at local level and also national level, both professional and social. That was very well identified uh, as a key gap. So the next one is, I suppose, the, 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 the challenges in progressing with multi-hazard approaches. Uh, I think these days it is a classic example. We are, we, we, we are facing a pandemic and at the same time there can be cyclones, floods and so on and so forth. So the, there are major challenges uh, that are linked to multi-hazard approaches. And this was very specifically identified in this, um, in this uh, case study also. And also there's another issue relating to cross-linking to other policy agendas. We all know we have a lot of policy agendas to deal with. The Sendai framework, the sustainable development goals, the climate change agreements, you name it. So to deal with these different types of uh, 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 policy agendas linking to cultural heritage and the DRR's perspective is, is not easy. So that has been a major challenge. 
And then, of course, we can't ignore about the financing. Financing is a major challenge, particularly in, in, in South Asian countries, and they, they simply haven't got the money to invest in, in, uh, in preventing cultural heritage sites uh, from, uh, from disasters. Then, of course, I can actually, this is just to summarize some of the other issues that, uh, that, that uh, I identified through this particular case study, dealing with multiple stakeholders. Of course, there were some obvious and others less so. So uh, it was enormous number of uh, stakeholders to deal with. And also in, 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 uh, in, in Sri Lanka in particular, there's a really uh, uh, massive need to link cultural heritage with uh, disaster risk management policy and practice. At the moment, they actually work in two different uh, paths and in isolation. And also there's a need to consider cultural heritage assets within the broader development concepts. That is very, very important from the point of view of disasters. And also in certain circumstances, perhaps some inappropriate in interventions to uh, particularly into to repair or to maintain cultural heritage assets was a was a, was a, was a problem. Uh, and also there are pressures uh, of, urban, uh, of urban development because of the increased, uh, increased population, you know, that we need to find space to, to, uh, uh, to house urban, uh, urban population. So it, it, it puts a lot of pressure on cultural heritage sites in the country and also the pressures from tourism to open up these sites as soon as possible uh, for, the, for the benefit of, of tourism. So these are actually some of the issues that I want to I want to highlight, but again, lack of time. Maybe perhaps the the key principles uh, uh, that that uh, the DRR principles that can be applied to heritage. Again, I have highlighted several key principles. Learning from this particular uh, particular case study and and to highlight uh, uh, a few here. Uh, I, I suppose you know the first one is I suppose linking with the scope of this seminar. The values for which the property was inscribed on the World Heritage List should be the foundation on which all other plans and actions are based. That can be a very good starting point. And also linking with that, the risk to cultural and natural heritage that DRR must address may originate inside the property or the surrounding environment. We really need to understand, understand that point. And also there can be both small and progressive factors that may increase the vulnerability of heritage to hazards. So those actually need to, uh, need to uh, be understood very well. Therefore, it is fair to say that the disaster risk reduction has a significant role to play in buffer zones of world heritage properties. So this is actually the key points that I want to emphasize uh, uh, from, uh, 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 from this case study linking up to the highlight of advanced, the, the importance of uh, uh, advanced planning and, um, and, and preparation. So these are actually some of the points that I want to highlight as part of that, for example, uh, uh, the prop, uh, consulting property occupants, maintenance programs, and also applying conservation uh, principles. So with that, I just want to sort of conclude my, my short intervention, emphasizing how important DRR is within cultural heritage planning and, uh, and, and preparedness by using this particular case study. So I'm very happy to share this information and I, I hope it, 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 it is a useful uh, uh, intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dilanti. Thank you to stay up with the time. Um, well, uh, I mean, uh, if you agree, I would postpone to queries uh, to the end of the series of speeches, except in the case of the next speaker, that is Professor Giulio Zucchero from the University of Naples, Federico II. Uh, Zucchero is uh, a full professor at the university, he is an, an architect by education, but uh, he developed uh, a, a, an expertise in the field of volcanology and uh, he deals uh, with the area of the region Campania and as a matter of fact uh, with an extended area. His presentation will give us an, an idea of what uh, measures can be adopted, including for the protection of cultural heritage, especially movable, but also some immovable. Please, Professor Zucchero. Thank you very much, Claudio. First of all, for having invited me to such a nice meeting. Uh, let me give one minute to greet Dilanti that uh, we have been involved together uh, last year's 
Hi, hi, Diland. In a European project together. Okay, uh, yes, uh, as you said in the introduction, uh, um, I am the scientific responsible of the uh, Pre New Study Center of the University of Naples, that is a center of competence for national civic protection. And uh, our task uh, is to uh, evaluate impact, um, impact scenarios after uh, basically after volcanic. Uh, eruption of Vesuvia Campi Flegrei, but as you know, the uh, eruption by volcanic eruption uh, is uh, a, is a, a compendium of uh, of, uh, of phenomena because we have earthquake, uh, ash fall, pyroclastic flow, and blah blah, and then we will list all of these. You know that uh, in the world, about more than uh, eight millions of people are at risk of volcanic eruption. The, not all the volcanoes are equal, are the same. We have a volcano that give explosive eruption that are the most tremendous and the most, uh, the most dangerous and effusive eruption like Etna. Vesuvius and Campi Fregliai that is just beside Naples, one on the right side and the other one on the on left side are, uh, are an explosive one. But we have another in front that is Ischia as well. So we are very well... Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, contoured by, by volcano. Um, what we do is uh, either risk analysis or impact scenario analysis. We have no time to go through in the detail um, of these, uh, uh, the, through the difference of these two analyses. But um, let's say that for volcano is more important to evaluate the scenario. So the impact, we have a, a reference scenario that is a subapalinian one, and uh, we evaluate the exposure. So the buildings, the transportation networks, people that of course are the main important to the civil, for the civil protection to, 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 to care with, because of course the population is the first thing to save. But of course, even cultural heritage, I have to say soon that no much has been done for cultural heritage. Something has been done. We will tell you later at the end of presentation, but a lot have to be done. So coming to the uh, action of the volcanic eruption, we have, uh, as you see, a list of phenomena, volcanic earthquakes as a precursors, uh, ash fall, uh, pyroclastic flow, landslide, large tsunami, bombs, missile, bradysias. But of course, we don't have time to go through all of these, even because the civil protection plan is focused basically on these three aspects, earthquakes, because of the precursors before the eruption, that it's important because could uh, uh, interrupt the uh, capability of a civil protection to evacuate the area. And so to put the, the to, to save people basically. Ashfall that uh, is uh, in a larger area, around and even in many in, in a range of many many kilometers and pyroclastic flow that uh, happens uh, soon after the eruption um, after the sustained column of the eruption collapse and so these pyroclastics wind wind uh, comes through the building volcano and uh, uh, can uh, burn uh, and kicked uh, all the uh, buildings and infrastructure on it. So, um, as we were saying, the volcanic eruption is a phenomenon where magma break the earth and come up, and so it uh, um, create earthquakes, basically, that are the precursors, and then when come up and there is the eruption, uh, could uh, create, uh, in the meantime, a lot of damage. We made a lot of scenario, either to Campi Flegrei and Vesuvio. This is an example of the earthquake uh, that is possible, uh, that is expected. It is a magnitude of 4.2 and is very shallow. So the damage are uh, quite considerable, intensity eight or intensity uh, nine. And to evaluate the impact on the building, we, 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 we studied the some vulnerability curves for ordinary building uh, according to the building typology occurring in the, in the area. Uh, this is a, an impact scenario that uh, has been evaluated for uh, 
some uh, interval. Obviously, this is always an, a, a, a probabilistic approach. So we have the media and the, 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 the lower boundary and, uh, and uh, the upper boundary. So a sort of limit of confidence of the results where we uh, evaluate for each comune uh, the, 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 the collapse of the building, uh, the building that are not feasible anymore, and the number of uh, dead, of injuries, and homeless. Um, this is derived by the building collapse, by the number of building collapse, and by the, uh, the, the, the distribution of uh, damage of the building on the territory. And according to that, we are able to evaluate the building, the, the, the damage to the people. So we define the estimation that are, as I was saying before, uh, dead, uh, injuries, and, and homeless. About the roads, it's very important to evaluate the probability of interruption of the roads after the earthquakes, because the interruption of the road will put in crisis all the evacuation plan. We have to evacuate more than 800 people uh, 800,000 people, sorry, uh, from, uh, from the area, that um, is, is an exodus, actually, is, a, is more than exodus. Uh, it's, a, it's an enormous amount of, of people that has to be carried out from the area. So we build up a model to evaluate the probability of interruption according to the vulnerability of the building that are facing the link that uh, if are weak, you know, uh, they, they could collapse on the road and uh, interrupt the road and uh, make a lot of trouble to the civil protection for the evacuation. Okay, and in fact, this is a some scenario that uh, show that. Another, another important uh, phenomenon is the ash fall. The ash fall that could be in the proximal area or the long distance area. These are the models of the plume, uh, and distribution and uh, of the centimeters of ashfall on the ground, according to the uh, uh, eruption, the, the, the reference sh uh, scenario um, of the eruption that has been assumed by the civil protection. Even for that, we build up the vulnerability curves for roof, and um, and uh, this is uh, uh, one of the possible impact. Uh, to due to uh, the uh, ash fall in Campi Flegrei expected, uh, and so as uh, for the Vesuvius. Uh, we have done even, as I was mentioning before, uh, an, uh, an evaluation of the ash fall at the long distance, because uh, in the proximal area, we can have even a couple of meters or even three meters of ash fall that, of course, collapse the roof. But in the long distance, we can have a few centimeters but these few centimeters gives a lot of disturbances to the roads, to the, to the um, uh, railways, to the airport, to the port, and to the uh, electric lines and uh, all the uh, lifelines, basically. So we evaluate this uh, uh, scenario of impact at long distance for uh, um, motorways, uh, roads, uh, and uh, all other kind of lifelines and the ports and airports and so on. And according to the millimeters of, uh, uh, of, of ash, we are able to make a scenario of impact and the disturbance on the population. And uh, even in terms of cost of death to the population, this is in detail one of these, uh, of these analysis. Finally, but, um, but it's, it's, it's perhaps the most dangerous, is the, the, the pyroclastic flow. The pyroclastic flow that could affect, obviously, uh, the buildings and infrastructures, and of course, uh, even uh, cultural heritage. Uh, what you see here is the uh, hazard uh, evaluation from INGV of Pisa, uh, Augusto Neri teams, uh, is able with uh, with, with a very complex elaboration of uh, of, uh, of a model of a fluid dynamic model to to give um, uh, the quantification of the dynamic pressure of the temperature and of the weight of, of the particle. We have evaluated even which is the barrier effects of buildings that of course. Uh, uh, transform a, a, a pyroclastic flow from steady state in turbulent 
and but could uh, 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 could modify the, the the dynamic pressure on the on the buildings. We have uh, evaluated vulnerability function against uh, this pyroclastic flow for buildings and infrastructure in the area. And this is uh, just a glance of the impact expected at the Campi Flegrei. Mitigation very quickly. We can uh, work on roof opening and facade that are the weakest uh, elements at risk of buildings. Roof uh, with uh, overlapping uh, very light uh, uh, steel formed frayed, uh, uh, framed structures opening by overlapping to the opening special panel and special windows with the special glass that has been studied at the Plinius Center. And uh, the same for facade. This gives another benefit, a co-benefit, because all these uh, adaptation, all these action for protecting the building from pyroclastic flow could be even intended as adaptation uh, action against the climate change effect, against heat waves uh, for energy savings. So there is a co-benefit that has been considered very, very, uh, in a very important way. These are other details. This is as a coal formed steel, um, so a sort of light uh, roof to overlap to the to the to the to the, to the actual roof in order to protect uh, being pinched as well from ashfall and so as a shell uh, in ultra high performance concrete in order to or some protection of facade or window. Few words to close my presentation for uh, heritage. We have, of course, around Vesuvian Campi Flegrei, very important sa archaeological site like. Uh, Pompeii, Ercolano, Oplonti, and Cuma, uh, or even others. And um, uh, the Vesuvian village, so of course, along the coast uh, of Vesuvius. And uh, uh, actually, these are the three, the three measures that has been inserted in the planning and used even in the exercise, basic and European exercise performed in 2006. That is the reinforcement of precarious archaeological structures. So, so, so bracing the ruins that could collapse under earthquakes. Um, the frisk is protected with the special panel because of the ashfall uh, and movable property. So everything that has a statue, so every other things that is movable could be transported a couple of months before the expected crisis to uh, the Royal Palace of Caserta that is out of a red and yellow zone. But as I said, the, the conclusion is there is still a lot to do. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation and thank you for staying very well in the time, actually. We are proceeding pretty well, so we will continue with our presentations so later on. But if there is any anybody that wants to raise a question after the Professor Zuccaro, because uh, in a while he is to go to the Academic Senate uh, and so he is to leave us. If there is anybody that wants to raise a question at this point on his presentation, he's welcome to, to, pro to propose it. Otherwise, we continue. Umberto? You, you can go on, I think, um, I suggest, Claudio. Okay, thank you very much. I thank will you. stay with you until uh, four o'clock. Uh, I'll be able to stay until four o'clock. I apologize for this, but there is a, an urgent meeting uh, at academic level that I cannot miss. So I'm sorry, really sorry. Thank you very much, Julio. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zuccaro. And uh, we will continue with uh, another presentation. As you have noticed, uh, we are taking uh, cases, we discuss territories, and we are talking about cases of major dimensions. And the next speaker is going to continue with this trend. I invite uh, to, the, uh, to present his, uh, his contribution, um, uh, William, uh, William Kimosop. I wish that uh, I pronounced Kimosop well. 
Uh, William is uh, a chief uh, ranger at the Balingo County. He is an uh, expert of wildlife. Uh, he has got uh, a degree at the Edgerton University in Kenya. And uh, he is leading a um, ranger, um, making a big effort to overlook uh, two major parks uh, uh, in the rift, in the Northern Rift Valley. That is the area where he, from 30 years, he is exploring and protecting the little, uh, little known areas. And uh, he has gained a lot of experience also in terms of uh, promoting uh, old African trails uh, through youth mentoring and active promotion of outdoor education. William, I'll leave, I'll leave you the floor, 10 minutes, please. That, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, this is a really a great privilege and honor for me uh, I, I see I probably may be the only one from Africa. So welcome uh, to the Great Rift Valley. This is one of the most uh, interesting and the largest geological feature in the face of Africa and I guess the earth. 6,000 kilometer fissure uh, from the Mozambique to the Jordan Valley. So this is quite a very interesting and a huge uh, geological feature. Uh, it is also a very old and a, a stable geology, as you all know, uh, uh, that uh, this is, uh, they say, the cradle of mankind, where most of the hominid remains are found. And so next, uh, next slide, please. So in the Kenya's Rift Valley system, we have three lakes that have been listed as uh, Kenya's uh, uh, World Heritage Sites, like, like uh, Elementaita, Lake Nakuru, and just above the equator, uh, Lake Bogoria. Um, and for this case, my area of jurisdiction is the area above Lake Bogoria, all the way towards uh, Lake Turkana. Um, I want to talk about a very, very um, significant event that has happened in the last seven years. Uh, and this is the rise of the Rift Valley lakes. As I said, this system has been very stable until seven years ago when we witnessed a non-returning rise of the lakes. At first, there was a flow back previously, 2009-2011. But September 2013, so the rice that never uh, returned back. And 2020 was actually at its peak. Next slide, please. And so in particular, I want to talk about Lake Bogoria Reserve, uh, which is actually a serially listed uh, uh, World Heritage Site. It is a protected area owned and managed by the local authority, which is the county government of Baringo. And uh, as I said that over the, over the years, it has been quite a very stable area, but seven years ago, we, experience this current unprecedented level. The levels were so high that in the 2020, it covers more, it covered all the all the sites, all the um, all the the roads or the road network that used to go around the lake. And it also sp spilled over to the community areas, which is much further than the, the, the boundaries of the terrestrial area. This in turn uh, has displaced hundreds of families, as you can imagine, in all the low-lying areas. It has also submerged infrastructure roads, bridges, um, uh, camping, camping sites, and etc., and also 
wildlife habitats. Next slide, please. And you can see um, most of the facilities are the, are the big picture is the gate you used to drive in. And that was just, um, you know, the, 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 it was a matter of um, um, time that the whole of that building was eventually submerged. However, we still have uh, the wildlife, especially the flamingos. And I must say, this is one of the uh, most major uh, habitat for uh, flamingos um, in Africa. Of course, of course, actually, lesser flamingos, 75% of the lesser flamingos now um, have this lake as their habitat. So from this picture, you can see that this lake has really, has really risen uh, in, a, in a scale that nobody alive today has ever seen it. Next slide, please. From the timeline of the satellite imagery, you can see that uh, the flood plains in 20, uh, 13 was beginning to build up. In fact, as we talk now, 2021 may even go beyond. Lake Bogoria is a salt water lake, meaning that it is a closed basin um, uh, uh, drainage. But further on, less than 20 or uh, 20 kilometers away, uh, is Lake. Uh, is Lake Baringo, which is a freshwater lake on a lower altitude. Um, any, any further rise will actually result in the mix up of the two waters. And that may pre present a very, very um, interesting scenario of which is going to be quite uh, dramatic because the salt water and the fresh water mixing in the same basin uh, may, may be, uh, is going to be a very, very uh, dangerous situation because this is, this is a water scarce area in, in, in the country. Thank you. Next slide, please. And so this phenomenon has caused and toll suffering. Um, uh, or not just with the people alone, but also the economy and the ecology of the area. Uh, most of the lands that uh, uh, were, were being um, cultivated for agriculture is now submerged. The park offices, the entry gates and the visitor center are no longer. In fact, I had to, we had to move to one last building at the higher point um, to give way, you know, to just a small office. Uh, we have other infrastructure like the roads, the health centers, the shopping center, the churches, uh, camping sites, all of them, including a few local hotels. In fact, in the next lake, all the hotels are literally underwater. And so combined with the current pandemic, uh, COVID-19, the area has been, uh, has had a double blow uh, from a natural catastrophe. Next slide, please. So we do not, nobody was ever prepared for this event up to now. I think even the authorities are still hanging on the fact that the water may turn back. And I can tell you that from what I have seen in the last seven years, there seem to be nothing like turning back. And so in the short term, uh, the people who are displaced had to move to temporary shelter on the higher grounds. Uh, some actually even had to move into the park, while others had to be accommodated by relatives and friends. And 
the, the, the water is still rising. One of the most important things that we need to do is actually to embark on very, very serious research to, to get a, a decision on the fate of you know, the whole area, not just the Bogori alone. The communities now live in fear, constant fear of an unknown future. Nobody knows what is next. We have a huge, quite a big town nearby, and it is on a low-lying area. Uh, well, displaced wildlife have also been a source of conflict. In the other lakes, in the other lake, which is uh, fresh water, when the water moved to the community areas, and so did the wildlife, and especially um, crocodiles, hippos, you just find them within the homes. If you cannot even um, move anymore. Next slide, please. And so as a way of um, conclusion or a way forward, we actually urgently need a more integrated and collaborative research. People who have dealt with these uh, such uh, pandemics before, such, such uh, problems before. Well, our own scientists, for instance, uh, they've, there's been a very, you know, they've been very puzzled. Everybody uh, has come over and go back into the cities. We are in a very um, remote areas uh, in, in the Rift Valley. And so we need to really model a, a possible future scenario so that uh, the government can take a more, more decisive action. Um, the other thing is to make a plan for resettlement, especially in the high to the higher areas and infrastructure restoration. Uh, this will involve for sure, mobilizing a substantial amount of resources, finance, um, you know, technical uh, expertise uh, to see what happens because we, people have to move out eventually. Um, I'm not in, um, I'm not in the scientific, I'm not a geologist, but for sure you can actually see uh, for yourself. I must say that the wildlife resilience has been observed because as they moved to new areas, they have really adopted. We used to have the plains wildlife, the gazelles and the cheetahs and all that, but now uh, they've all moved to unfamiliar territories and began to, to adopt to the new uh, um, uh, to, the, to, the new, to the new environment. Uh, the other is an elaborate uh, just protection is required because some areas uh, wildlife had been killed or had been decimated and people might be seeing um, an opportunity for you know more, more wildlife and poaching can, can be increased. Um, I wasn't prepared for a long, uh, uh, discussion, but this is just to highlight to you that there is a new uh, and a growing problem here in Africa, and we definitely uh, need a lot of expertise. Uh, we've had quite a number of um, efforts by government. A large study, an extensive study, had been commissioned. I'm not. I'm yet to be. Uh, I'm yet to get. Um, uh, the, the copies of, of, of this uh, report, but hopefully from this uh, uh, study, more action and more, more um, you know, efforts can now be put. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, William. Thank you for your presentation and to stay on time also. Uh, now, um, I would uh, pass uh, to another sort of uh, disaster. Now we have seen uh, already quick, quick, a good quantity of typology, but uh, 
Last August the 4th, uh, in the port of Beirut, a boat uh, a ship exploded and uh, practically destroyed the old city of Beirut, uh, leaving uh, plenty of people also in this case displaced. I would leave the ground to Antoine Lahoud, who is uh, an architect by education. He teaches at the Lebanese uh, American University in Beirut and in Biblos. And uh, he has uh, been uh, entrusted for the recovery of the area of Ashrafia, which is an old quarter in Beirut. Uh, for those who know, Beirut uh, is uh, Ashrafia is uh, used to be a very lively area of the city. Please, uh, Antoine, the ground is yours. Ten minutes. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, first, thank you, um, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Simino and the committee, to allow me to share with you uh, the case of disaster and the uh, pandemic of Beirut in the case of the explosion that took place on August 4th. Um, uh, Uh, basically, uh, the explosion of Beirut, it happened on August 4, 2020, at 6 uh, and 7 minutes. And it was really a, a very bad case. And maybe Beirut, it's not a World Heritage Site. You know, in, in Lebanon, we have uh, five World Heritage Sites. That's why Beirut is very rich by the... Um, built heritage uh, cases and it has a very very it very rich with archaeological site as well especially ashrafia and the site um i will talk during my presentation about the case of what's happening and what affected about this i will introduce the maze the case of and the port uh, as well which is uh, what where the explosion happened uh, um, um, the port in Beirut uh, started uh, around 18, maybe before, but around 1860, uh, the, the, the port started and the area of Jemezi flourished because of the port in the, in the history. And now the, the, the Jemezi uh, turned into ashes because of the port at the same time. And the story changed, by, by the way. The, the architectural typology of Ashrafi, the area, it has many stairs, very known stairs in the area. And these stairs connected the area of Jumeze by the upper area, what we call it Sirso Street, which is also known by the very sophisticated building and very rich houses, because Sirso is a very rich family in the history. And it has the type, the architectural typology, it's known, but we call it colonial French ar architecture because we have the occupation of the French in Lebanon between the 1909 uh, uh, till the 1945. Uh, and because of the colonial architecture, we have the typology based on the Lebanese typology with some modification. It's based on the, what we call it, the Lebanese central royal house with the three arches in the middle and the balcony and the corbel was some modification related to the French architecture. Um, 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 the blast or the or the what we call it the explosion, it was one of the biggest non-nuclear explosion in history. One of the biggest area of Beirut, it's located around the port. Um, it's back, uh, it, it is Ottoman, late Ottoman and French colonial mandate, uh, at the, and the area it's between 1819 and 1913. And it was turned into ashes. I can tell you yani, around yani, almost all, all the area it was uh, damaged, yani, totally damaged. The, uh, and the area it called Jemaze, Manchel, Mdawar, Sirso Street, and Carantina. Um, um, more than 600 historical houses, I mean, like this house, were completely destroyed around the, 
1.5 billion in property were damaged and 300,000 people were left homeless. Um, about casualty, in the night of the blast, hospital used two months worth of supplies. Uh, and I can say, and one, I have seen many explosions and a war, but I have never seen, and I saw on August 4, said a nurse, uh, her name is Khalaf, who has worked at St. George Hospital for 20 years, uh, 28 years, with her colleague. She stitches and uh, entubed and bended victim on the street and the pavement outside the ER. Um, the explosion caused at least 6,500 6, injuries and 207 uh, deaths, including children. Hour after the blast, Lebanese volunteer rushed to poor people from the collapsed home, carry the injury to hospitals and set up makeshift clinic to take the burned odd overwhelmed emergency room because it was really a panic everywhere in Beirut. The day after the blast, I mean in August 5 on the morning, not the government, but civil society, volunteer and Lebanese NGOs flew to help clean the city and distribute aid to survive. We were doing why the sound? We were doing uh, what the government do, have to do. They claim the volunteer because the government did nothing at, at the time. A cargo of 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate, equivalent to around 1.1 kiloton of TNT, has been stored, uh, stored illegally in a warehouse without a proper safety measure for the previous six years, since 2013 in Beirut, the explosion led to a total uh, destruction of a zone within two kilometer radius. Um, what we did, Dian, an urgent assembly of architect and restoration expert under the super of Antiquity and Ministry of Culture emerged. In a close collaboration with the UNESCO, ECOMOS, ECROM, and Order of Engineers, and many volunteers, um, the Built, built uh, Heritage Rescue 2020 began working like bee in a beehive under very harsh and risky condition because uh, uh, because it was a condition very hard because converting both the pandemic and the destroyed houses condition because you are working under this and under the the houses it was very uh, destroyed totally and the and the pandemic at the same time the survey result following the assessment we had under uh, houses under total risk 90 the urgent need of consolidation houses for propping 280, in need of fast intervention of emergency 350 house, in need of sheltering without roof, any, any more roof, 600 roof, around 4,250 apartments in need of total restoration. This is a case, uh, you can see here the houses before the one, one case, and yeah, before the before the blast and after the blast, the roof before the blast, and what they did as, as a sheltering for the roof. And here on the right side here, you can see here uh, on the kind of propping and um, to, 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 to make the roof standing. And this is a kind of sheltering uh, here to protect the roof from the rain and from the weathering because we were in August and we did this between August, September and, and October before the raining started. Yani. And we did all the work of sheltering to protect the houses and to, pro and to make this work in three months, not more than three months. Um, and after two days of the blast, following the explosion in August 6, the French president Emmanuel Macron paid an emotional visit to the extensively damaged Jamaica neighborhood 
and encourage the community to keep fighting against the corruption because it was really a big corruption. And after, um, and then the director of the UNESCO, this is Audrey Azulay, came on August 27. After her visit to the destroyed uh, sites, Mrs. Azulay uh, shared her interest in damaging schools during a press conference at the Surso Palace, and because she made the uh, visit to the Surso Palace, it was also destroyed totally. She announced in the name of UNESCO the launching of fundraising campaign for Beirut and for more specifically the schools because she uh, the estimation of the restoration of the school it was 300 million euro um, uh, and Mrs. Azuri was impressed by the work uh, of the, this 20 days after the blast of the dynamic force of the volunteer and the architect um, also the, the German ambassador presenting the German uh, government um, make a visit also to some traditional houses in Jemaisi after the completion of the propping and sheltering intervention sponsored by the German government. Because the German uh, government contribute in 500,000 euro were spent in consolidation for propping and sheltering for 12 houses in Beirut. Um, this is a uh, uh, the reason of collapsing for the slabs in the major houses around the 100 house collapsed all the slabs because uh, the, the slabs were, were was made from uh, from wooden uh, structure um, and um, with time after 100 years the wooden and the connection was wall and the humidity and the and the time factor uh, it was really um, on the connection here, and I mean by this, uh, was, was the humidity and the connection, it was really weak uh, here. And this is why, and with the blast, all the slab fall down. And we, ha we have the same case here, more than um, maybe 300 uh, slab uh, fall down totally because of, of the wooden structure in Beirut. Uh, concerning the the sheltering, uh, we made the total restoration for the for the pitches roof uh, wooden structure. You can see here, and uh, this part is all new, and this part all this new. We make all this new. We are putting this because when we need to re, re put the roof tiling to have the same dimension, but we are not putting now the roof tiling because it's not available. It's, the cost is very high. We are putting only. Uh, different material. Uh, what we are putting, it's a three kinds of material. First, what we call an umbrella using the tarp, which is the flex system. It's it's, a, it's elevated part from the roof uh, on, a, on a steel structure, one bar on the middle, and we make it stretch on the tool system on the tarp. Or we put a, a tarp, which is a flex on, on all the structure of the wood. This is the other system that we, we use it in some cases. Or the most common, we are putting a corrugated sheet metal, which is a light metal corrugated, and we replace the, the, the roof tile structure on the roof now. And we use this on more than 300 houses in Beirut. Um, uh, this is uh, one of the drawings for the case study, uh, what we are doing. We are um, uh, removing uh, and dismantling the stone, uh, which is not stable in the houses. We are putting structure of wood to replace the wood. We are putting a corrugated metal here in replacing the roof tiling. And we are restoring all the house. We are, we are uh, putting all the, from the inside, uh, propping all the house from inside. And you can see here, uh, this is a structure to make structure for the opening, all the structure for the opening by wood. You can see here, all the opening are re restructured by wooden structure here and here, all the wooden structure, uh, all the opening to really, to save the opening. We are making propping inside. We are uh, all the wall, which is not stable. We are removing, the, dismelting the walls. We are putting number, if you can see here on the stone, to re-put it back in, in order later on. And we are putting a structure of wall, wood here to replace the wall. 
later on we are putting here a, 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 a trap here on the on the wood structure really to protect the house from any weathering or rain or anything um, please for... Tony, Tony yes. please time is uh, shortening please if okay, you could, uh... okay okay but to, to stop here on the conclusion Thank you. on the conclusion really must uh, in conclusion the first phase of propping in, in consolidation uh, for the, it was the remaining phase of consolidation. It was a crucial injection to people in the street of the main and allowed. Due to the uh, internet, uh, political conflict, the fund uh, of the country expected did not uh, did not allow and to continue the work. Um, what we are feeling, we are feeling the Beirut heritage. It became uh, it, it became handicapped Ashrafi. In addition, we should be very caution at uh, it not reviving the experience of Solidaire because this is Solidaire here and this is Ashrafi before the blast. Uh, downtown Beirut is very well dressed city, but it lasts her soul. As for the reconstruction, we strongly emphasize on equivalence important of restoring both the city, soul, and the stone. Uh, in the end, uh, in the end, honey, thank you for your presentation. And you, as the time, was a great hope, and we hope the, uh, we have the time to to, to make uh, all the restoration and to give uh, the citizen back to their home. Thank you, thank you, Tony. Very well presented. Um... Pretty, pretty rich of material. I'm sure that then uh, we will have uh, space for discussion and return on the topic. I would leave the ground now to two researchers, and uh, they are engineers at background, and they are focusing on uh, earthquakes. So we pass to another continent. Now we are in Peru. The, they are Giulia Cocco and Alberto Basaglia. They are PhDs in uh, engineering and postdoctoral at the University of Chieti in Pescara, in, Pescara at, um, in Italy. And they are now dealing with the seismic problems for the protection and problems of the vulnerability for cultural heritage at risk. Thank you, the ground is yours. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'm going to share and uh, we are uh, Giulia Cocco and Alberto Basaglia, and we are pleased to introduce our project concerning the seismic risk assessment of the historic center of Cusco in Peru. Cusco is one of the uh, most important cities in Peru, and uh, it is declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site since uh, uh, 1983. Uh, thanks to the presence of several uh, religious and civil uh, buildings with uh, an high cultural value uh, that needs to be preserved, especially against environmental disasters such as earthquakes. Indeed, Cusco belongs to an area with an high seismic risk, and one of the most severe earthquakes of the past was the 1950 earthquake uh, that uh, caused uh, several collapses. So in addition to the cultural heritage of this city that must be preserved, we must consider also that Cusco has a high population density and a high tourist flow uh, every year. So um, it's crucial to make people aware about the seismic risk of this area. Uh, for this reason, the main goal of our project uh, concerns the seismic vulnerability assessment of the historic center of Cusco. And this project uh, is framed within a cooperation agreement uh, um, since uh, 2018 between our university with the University uh, Andina of Cusco and the Pontific Pontifical Catholic University of Peru in Lima and also with the municipality of Cusco. The first step of our project was a survey campaign in order to uh, collect all the necessary data for our study. Uh, this survey campaign uh, took uh, 10 months and was done with the cooperation of both Italian and Peruvian uh, students. And during this survey campaign, we focused the attention on the residential buildings of this historic center 
and we collect all the information with a um, specific survey form in order to collect all the architectural and uh, structural uh, um, data. And uh, at the end, we analyze 834 uh, residential building of the historic center. Um, then all the uh, collected data were organized in a georeference database in order to study also the territorial distribution of this uh, structural information. For instance, here we can see the territorial distribution of the main structural systems. And we can see that uh, uh, the most common type of uh, structural system is the adobe. Um, uh, indeed, the adobe is one of the most common uh, structural material, construction material in this area. Uh, for another example can be the territorial distribution on the foundation type that are mainly stone foundation and particular are the Anset Inca foundation, as we can see in the picture uh, located in the upper part of the slide. Uh, that are particular because they are characterized by uh, big square stone blocks. So considering the cultural heritage value of this historic center and all the geometrical and structural future, uh, feature collected during the in-situ survey, uh, we um, apply a vulnerability index-based method. The vulnerability index is an index that is able to define the uh, vulnerability level of each building. And uh, it is computed based on a critical analysis uh, uh, from the structural point of view. So considering the uh, structural uh, um, feature and also the structural uh, um, deficiencies of each buildings, we can analyze the a vulnerability index. Here in this map, we can see the first results we obtain uh, computing the vulnerability index on about 300 residential buildings belong to the most peripheral area of the historic center. And uh, in dark blue, we can see the most, uh, vulner the most, vulnera the most vulnerable structure. So uh, the, the structure with the highest vulnerability index. Uh, so, computing this vulnerability index for a representative number of buildings, basically we, uh, uh, we uh, perform a seismic vulnerability assessment of this historic center on the urban scale. So now we know uh, which are the most vulnerable structures, where they are located, so in which area of the historic center is more urgent to intervene. Uh, and uh, all these information are the base to plan mitigation strategies in order to make Cusco safer. Another important results coming from this methodology are the um, uh, fragility cures that are able to predict the um, probability to exceed a certain damage level for different in earthquake intensities. For instance, if in Cusco an earthquake with a PGA equal to 0.20 G occurs, we can see that 6% of the analyzed stock of building will suffer a damage higher than the level four, that means collapse. 25% uh, of the analyzed buildings will suffer a damage than D3, that means uh, severe damages. 33% uh, of them uh, will suffer um, damage level higher than D2, that means uh, moderate damage and so on. So basically these fragility cures are able to define the expected damage scenario for different seismic intensity. So uh, the seismic vulnerability assessment of the historic center allow to create a georeferency database with more information that can be a valid tool for the, for the municipality to uh, know the current configuration of the city. Then uh, defining the vulnerability index for a representative number of buildings, we were able to define the main structural fragilities of dwellings and also to define the expected damage scenario. And all these information are the base to define uh, intervention plans and uh, so the strategic uh, um, uh, plan to uh, reduce the vulnerability of these uh, residential buildings. Moreover, um, these results are also very useful to define emergency limit condition plans that are able to prepare the population in case of a disaster. 
And my colleague Alberto Basaglia tells you about this. Thank you very much, Julia. So speaking about mitigation strategies and the importance to prioritize the mitigation strategies, the Italian Civil Action Department defined the concept of emergency limit condition that is a subsystem of a city, including four main elements. The first element is strategic building. So all buildings hosting essential services during an emergency, then emergency areas or those areas that can be used to gather injured and homeless and also set up temporary shelters and then accessibility infrastructures that are all routes connecting strategic buildings and emergency areas with the outside of a city so to allow the carrying on of rescue activities and finally interfering buildings so those buildings whose collapse even partial can block or cause serious delays to the carrying on again of rescue activities so all together DLC can be schematized as a chain or rather as a series system where each element must work if we want the entire system to work. So for Cusco, we based our study on the analysis of the evacuation plan and the emergency operation plans defined by, by the municipality, where we got some hints of what could be the essential buildings for Cusco, as well as the accessibility map also defined by the Grente of the Historic Center, the Regency of the Historic Center, which lists all routes depending on their type and their width. If you can move on, Julia, the slide, please. Yes. Okay, thank you. So with this information, we define the ELC for Cusco. If you can see, if you can go on with the slide, Julia, please. Sorry. Here without and with redundancies. A redundancy is an additional activity infrastructure that can be used if the main one is not available. So focusing our attention at the, with the LC without redundancies, we can see that in Cusco, almost all essential buildings are along the same route, the Disamil del Sol, and we have a reasonable number of emergency areas. So we can, like the, in case of disaster, we can gather there the injured and homeless and set up shelters. On the other hand, if we focus our attention on the accessibility infrastructures, we can see that all except one, it is Amida El Esercito that is crossing the lower left of the map, all other routes, they have a high number of interfering buildings. So this high density of Cusco in case of a disaster may be a serious issue for the carrying on of rescue activities because they can pose serious delays. So at the end, just summarizing our work, we are planning to continue our work in Cusco with additional projects and our final aim is to strengthen the cooperation between academia and local governance and when not the safety of Cusco, they can be translated also in policies and why not in future updates of the master plan. With that, we, uh, we are, if you have any questions or comments, you are more than welcome to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. With this last presentation, we ended up with the series of presentation that characterized this, uh, this uh, session. Um, I, before passing the ground to some queries posed by the public, I suppose that there are a few. Are there, Hilda? So waiting for some queries from the ground. Um, I would like to, to sort of try to um, review with you because uh, it's pretty impressive the dimension, the scale of the problematic that is approached. We did uh, really have a range of, of, of options. And the case studies that were presented were all um, revealing that there was uh, some attention. So what, uh, what, what's next? In other words, uh, in Africa, the case of Kenya, we have seen the lakes. We have a phenomenon that is ongoing and they are trying to identify the cause. And then there is a notion that is a, 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 someone taking care, but uh, it's a matter of studying. It's a matter of the world of sciences and perhaps it's a matter of combination, but also in Cusco, the last presentation we have seen, uh, 
there is uh, an authority concern. Uh, equally, we can say from Beirut uh, and the case of uh, we have just seen uh, of the of the explosion and the fire, uh, not to mention the tsunami. So, I mean, we are talking of events of big dimensions, but nevertheless, we end up and always making the accountancy. What does it take to really realize uh, mitigation measures so that uh, instead of taking being taken uh, in spite of our own uh, uh, awareness, how can we prevent to be taken by surprise and be able to react? What are the obstacles that are faced? Is there a possibility to create models of cooperation so that uh, uh, between the local communities and the authorities, there is sort of uh, an action plan ready to be implemented? I mean, uh, what does it take? So I would like to have a round of, uh, from your experiences, uh, from your studies, what is the reaction? I would start with the Dilanti. Dilanti. I wonder if she got the question. No, she's not there. Well, let's pass to the case of uh, of um, Beirut. Tony, Tony Lehud. Are you there? Yes, yes. Yeah, what the, in your experience, I mean, how, how is it the, the issue? I mean, when you had this blast, uh, I, I saw, I mean, you presented to us the volunteers and the, the reconstruction, but um, I imagine that in your case, really, you were pre taken by surprise. I mean, nobody expected that the big ship loaded of explosive material is in a port, isn't it? Uh, uh... You know, uh, we have many issues. Uh, um, uh, first, we have a corrupted uh, government, by the way, and, and everybody knows this, and even the, the European community knows this, and by the way. But uh, the, the major problem, and we passed through, uh, through a civil war for 15 years from 1975 to 1990, and we have uh, all Beirut was totally destroyed, not this part of Beirut, but the, what you call downtown Beirut. And uh, and then we make like a uh, reconstruction for what we call it the project by Solidaire uh, uh, construction of Beirut, started by 1994 till 2000. And we, went, we went through this experience, but unfortunately it was not, we didn't learn from our experience as a governmental issues, yani. um, uh, yani having uh, this, all this process and all this cost, what it cost all the government a lot of millions, yani, uh, billions, not millions, to re re rebuild the, the, all the city of infrastructure and rebuild all the city. Uh, and now um, uh, uh, we don't have any measures of protection for anything in our country, not only, uh, um, not only our heritage or our building or our city. Uh, uh, for many things, we, we can say this, we have many problems at, at all levels. Uh, many, we have risks everywhere, not only um, uh, at the port or at the yani, yani, uh, citizens uh, live the risk at any minute. Yani. You know, I will not talk politics, but you know, Yanni, we have um, we have at uh, 2006. If you, if, I will not talk politics, but I have to say this: at 2006, we have the uh, problem, uh, political problem at Lebanon when the Hezbollah uh, make a problem with uh, our neighbor, the Israeli, and this led to a total dest destruction of all Lebanon from the south to the north because it was a reaction of the, the army, of the Israeli army. And this led to a, a reconstruction of Lebanon for four years till the, from 2006 to till 2010 to make uh, stability for the 
and we have all the school, all the bridges, all the street, and we, and all, as well, we have some archaeological site that was uh, also uh, knowing it has blue shields at that time, but it was also uh, bombarded by the Israeli uh, airplanes and this. Uh, I will tell you something. You tell me why? Because um, we have no. Maybe maybe our politicians don't care for our uh, not citizen, not even our our values, not even our treasure, not even our uh, heritage. Maybe um, they care only for uh, uh, the wealthy that ha they have. I don't know well, how to say this or how to mention this. Yeah, but I mean, can I? Can I um, just uh, say that uh, you have been so much into so many different issues in history that uh, prepare, pre preparedness should be sort of embedded in your genetics because to my memory, I've seen uh, lots of different events occurring into Lebanon. But I mean, I wonder whether uh, the scenario is similar. Just uh, I thank you, uh, Tony, I would pass uh, now Claudio, you are muted. Sorry. Uh, William, uh, um, I would like to hear your, your experience in Kenya. Uh, to my understanding, you are very much into it, into trying to, to work out the problem of the salty water raising in, into, into your region in the rift. Um, uh, is there a participation at the level of authorities. So what is the level of uh, uh, participation from central and peripheric authorities of the state? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, there, there has been some level of concern, but however, that has not translated into action on the ground. Uh, the various uh, uh, local governments have been left to, you know, to, to try and uh, give solutions to uh, their local people. However, as I said, that there was, there's been a very um, extensive attempt to study the effects of all this uh, pandemic, uh, all this uh, disaster, sorry, uh, that uh, a big uh, study was commissioned uh, October last year, and I think they have just concluded their findings, but the problem is still going on. Uh, one of the major issues that really um, affects us is we don't have a strong civil defense, um, you know, sort of a structure the disaster management departments are still very rudimental. We don't have uh, um, the area I am. It's only that because I am a ranger uh, and based on the ground, it is only the, my our observations that have been uh, being uh, depended on. Um, the other problem is we don't have a local scientific sort of setup, a research department or geology department that is active on the ground. And so we are left with efforts that uh, seem to be happening uh, or, or uh, efforts that are being taken um, ad hoc, you know, no particular, no particular directed efforts. One the other gap is that the, science, the scientific world uh, may not have the resources enough to actually cover the grounds, to have moni to monitor the levels of water and the rates that it is moving in order even to bring out a model uh, for whatever time. And so, the other, the last thing is, everybody seems to be working in, in their own silos. And this is my major concern. 
if we have say the UNDP or UN Habitat to come on, on board and bring everybody together, I think this could be a way out. Uh, and as you also know that the parts of the country that all these effects are taking place, we're still struggling with the basic development requirements, roads, schools, hospitals, and all that. And then enter the natural disaster, and it, which is, you know, uh, um, eroding all the gains that uh, we've been trying to over the years. So situation may take a bit of time, but yes, we really need to take concerted, you know, efforts. I'm only uh, from the natural world, um, probably with the pro uh, office, office or governance structure on the ground, but then all the other departments really need to come on board. Uh, thank you. Thank you, William. Um, I, I I suppose uh, I mean when we, um, we heard about volcanic uh, mobilization of population uh, for um, risk preparedness uh, measures in the case of Pompeii, Ercolano, Campi Flegrei areas, and uh, up to uh, Caserta Reggio. Uh, Regia of Caserta in uh, the Naples region. And they have measured uh, the number of people, the type of uh, mobilization that would be needed, uh, what sort of uh, preventive measures can be used in order to mobilize, to at least put into safety movable heritage and uh, perhaps some uh, uh, cultural heritage, uh, immovable. Um, but uh, I wonder, uh, uh, for, uh, I would like uh, Dilanti, Dilanti Amarat Amaratanga, uh, could you please uh, uh, tell us, uh, I mean, from your perspective, I mean, uh, you, you presented the case of tsunami, which is uh, one of the highest, the most destructive events that I can dream of. So, I mean, uh, in that case, uh, I mean, uh, there are now better knowledge after the experience we did in the early 2000s, but I mean, uh, is there, is there some, uh, is there some uh, experience done in terms of uh, cultural heritage and tsunami? Is there some uh, sort of action taking place uh, in order to improve the capacity to prevent and to mitigate the effect of tsunami on cultural heritage, for instance? Claudio, yes. I, I think that Dilanti is not here, but uh, Alberto want to, I think that uh, he has a, a, a possible answer to the question. Please, please do, before. please. And just to make sure you asked what are the barriers to actions, right? More than barriers to action, what I, I mean, uh, let's say that uh, barriers have been well represented by um, Antoine Lahoud and uh, and uh, and uh, William. I I believe that uh, there is uh, an issue of uh, dimension. We are talking territory, of course. In this in this session, we are focusing on big dimension event and yes. big dimension to take care of so that uh, instead of a specific site we are talking about the districts eventually cultural districts entire cities entire uh, valleys so we are talking at dimensions that are definitely and are unusual and difficult to manage in a way mm -hmm. uh, 900,000 people in the Naples region to evacuate is not an irrelevant number I mean it takes hours if not days to, to properly move all these people so that I mean uh, you know, major events do not uh, let you much margin of time to, so that uh, everything should be well prepared if you want to have some mitigation measure uh, to be successful. But my question is after the tsunami experience, for instance, the tsunami gives you a very short time span, more or less a few hours, uh, several hours. So, so that, I mean, uh, for cultural heritage, is there something in place that prevents tsunami? I mean, uh, I mean, I know that the people dealing with disaster risk reduction in general take this under the viewpoint of culture, uh, culture of people, 
and the major infrastructure, but uh, cultural heritage are not considered normally as the priority to save, which is, uh, you know, in the, say, in the case of world heritage, it's not exactly as such. So my idea is, how, my question is, is there someone who has figured out, I'm sure that they, it exists, uh, because in the Sendai, uh, the Sendai framework, it's uh, foreseen culture and cultural heritage as well. So that I, um, I'm sure that somebody is elaborating. My question is, uh, are there evidence of something reasonably doable, concretely in place? To avoid damage. To prevent or to reduce damage okay. at least. Um, I can speak from the Italian perspective. We had two major tax breaks I would like to call them tax break, like policies to um, incentivate, like people retrofitting their house, both from the energy and the seismic point of view, that were basically like covering, I don't know if we're like from 85 to like the old cost of the buildings work. And the first one didn't work at all. The second one is working, but because it is also mainly focused on energy consumption. So something that will have you like uh, um, something back, like so you're, not, you're spending less money for heating, for example, you're not seeing it right now. So I think the first, I think we have th two to three layers of complexity. The first layer of complexity is knowledge. People must know, they must be aware of risk knowledge because it is usually seen like an earthquake, okay, it will not happen during my lifetime. It will come back in 50 years, 100 years, I will be dead already. It is not my problem, it's not my concern. And we've seen it is not like this. So people should make them aware of the possible risk and the possibility of risk and that every money spent in preventing risks will be something worth it, like it be something they, they, will, they will get revenue from. The second thing is again money, because we've seen often this period of pandemic, how much money can be spent in disasters and people should be allowed the possibility to do interventions, to do like works on their own. And the third thing I could add, <laughs> it is a, like a really Italian thing, is that most people live in apartment complexes. And in apartment complex, like you have to make all the people decide to do this work. And if you live with 30, 20, even 10 families, there will be someone who will say, no, I don't care about it. I don't want to do it. And so you have to, to have the complete uh, coverage of people that are aware of the risk. And lastly, if as I were talking about heritage, in Italy has a lot of historic centers, a lot of the heritage buildings. Uh, it, also, it is also an issue, the decision on what work to do that can preserve the heritage while achieving the desired level of safety. That is something that, of course, engineers and architects, they are able to do it and we could do it, but again, it is a, a complex issue to tackle. So I'm just throwing out complexities <laughs> of this word that we have to deal with on a regular basis. Thank you. Um, um, I thought that Dilanti was still online, but uh, she is not uh, evidently. I would like to question about the, um, the case studies of Cusco. Since you spoken now, I would like to hear Julia eventually to react. I mean, uh, how is the reaction to your studies in, uh, in the Cusco case study that you presented, how is the local authorities' involvement? I mean, uh, how far does go their own uh, keenness uh, to undertake measures after your studies? I mean, you do um, focus on earthquakes and um, the, the problems connected to the danger and the eventuality of an earthquake. But the uh, mm, Normally, this type of action, this type of studies, drive to um, some action from the authorities. Normally, yes. I suppose that you have a link 
what is the capacity of this uh, study to turn into some actual instrument uh, that is uh, conveniently used by those responsible authorities? Yes, uh, the final aim of our work is to help the local authorities to uh, organize an um, intervention plan on the urban scale. Obviously, uh, uh, they need of uh, financial funding that maybe is the, the main problems. Uh, when we went to Pusco and present our work to the municipality and other uh, local authorities, uh, uh, they, um, uh, they were happy to, to know that uh, there was a, um, this kind of project because uh, uh, in the project are involved also academia, Peruvian academia, Peruvian universities. Um, during this period, the COVID didn't help us uh, to have uh, 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 contact with uh, the municipality because uh, um, uh, it was a difficult period for everyone, especially in Peru. Um, we hope that in the future, at the end of this project, uh, uh, our results can be uh, a valid tool for, the, uh, for uh, the local authorities. We are also uh, trying to uh, define, for instance, uh, the um, reconstruction uh, time, uh, to the time to recover after an earthquake, the reconstruction time of buildings. Uh, and we are trying also to consider the commercial activities in the historic center because uh, we know that Cusco uh, has a nice tourist, tourist flow every year. So the um, commercial activities are uh, really important in the economy of the city. Um, we, we hope that these results can be uh, used from the municipality to do something and to take action on existing buildings. Um, but maybe there is a problem between the communication, the, there, is a pro, there is problems uh, in the communication between uh, academia and uh, local authorities. It is not easy. Thank you. This seems to be a clear picture um, and uh, it's pretty recurrent issue. Uh, but I see an interesting query from Mario Santana. Uh, and uh, Mario is uh, meaning about uh, the assessment of uh, uh, outstanding universal values, if I'm not wrong. And uh, it states that uh, he thinks is important. And of course, if we are talking about uh, world heritage, uh, that is one of the key criteria for the, uh, how to, for the for the world heritage to be assessed. Uh, could we give uh, the voice to Mario? Mario Santana, please. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Nice. Uh, I'm sorry, I just <laughs> catch the last part of the of the seminar. But I was really interested in the example of Cusco because when we do a risk preparedness strategy, especially for earthquakes, we always take into consideration, you know, the outstanding universal value and the attributes of the city of Cusco. And one of the attributes of the city of Cusco, of course, is the urban planning, you know, the planning of the city and, and all the different layers of history. And then another point that I found really interesting because I had the opportunity to be in Cusco many times is that, um, I mean, it's very chaotic in terms of, you know, evacuating tourists, but I think that the answer was, was already put in the chat. So thank you. Thank you, Mario. Thanks a lot. Um, before uh, we wrap up, I would like to verify whether on the ground there are some other questions that, uh, like that of Mario, was uh, sort of suggestive. Um, Definitely the issue of outstanding, uh, outstanding universal value being one of the criteria why a place is uh, decided to be World Heritage Site. A natural disaster or whatever sort of disaster, technogenic or whatever the source of the disaster, 
has an impact and could cause uh, uh, even a, a total transformation. Let's, uh, let's say the case of Kenya, where a natural site can be transformed, can tra transform naturally transformed. And uh, we don't know. I mean, uh, it's, still, it's still under study. So, I mean, it is evident that uh, the, the issue at stake is, is an issue of a certain relevance because uh, you may even alter to the point that the natural, the, the status of cal cultural or natural heritage under protection may be less, uh, less relevant. I'm just wondering uh, or provoking in a way. Um, I just wonder whether there is some other new query Would you, do you hear me? Because I get feedback that somebody doesn't hear me. I hear you, yes. We can hear you. Ah, very good. So, um, so the idea is, um, if there are no other questions, I think we should uh, have a final wrap up. Uh, I would like to, to question whether in all your experiences uh, you have seen uh, whether there is room in the countries where you operate, whether there is a ground, but also from the floor, we can get the uh, answer if somebody asks, whether there are signs of good practice in terms of public-private partnerships into the protection of cultural heritage in terms of uh, disaster prevention and so on. In other words, when I mean private public, uh, I mean, uh, whether the public institutions, uh, local authorities have manifested uh, a certain keenness to cooperate with NGOs, civil society organizations, individual citizens, and in, whether they have established a structured relationship into this direction. Or do you have any such experience? Uh, I have some, but I would like to see whether you have some of these experiences that uh, we can consider to be good practice to take example from because uh, natural disaster or disaster in general have a dimension just the the word disaster is a connotation of the event is uh, overwhelming event so um, are there some experiences that in this floor can be testified of uh, structured cooperation between uh, civil society and uh, authorities, uh, civil society and uh, civil protection. Uh, normally this uh, we, we see on the television people that uh, the civilians that at some point are gathered just volunteer on the spot, but nothing structured. It's uh, very rare to see somebody that is really structurally organized and prepared and knows what to do. Normally it's spontaneous. And unfortunately, sometimes also, since uh, these people are not trained, not necessarily useful, or sometimes could be even uh, counter uh, a problem because it could cause damage to the heritage, especially the movable heritage, if it's not well organized. So, um, are there some experiences that you can testify of major events when the people were ready to respond? And I'm making this question is uh, a, a question that I do to also to myself, but uh, substantially is one of the reasons why our World Heritage was started is to see whether we can improve the level of management of cultural heritage in, in disaster and pandemics it would be very useful to answer to this question or to find answers to the questions. William had uh, have raised the hand. Please, William. Uh, yes, <clears throat> we, we've seen a very big interest and already our local uh, authority uh, are having uh, some kind of understanding with the Kenya Red Cross. And uh, they are developing at the moment uh, an emergency operation center, which I have also contributed in our department. We have an all, um, we had we had 
that we have a business William, we have problem. William, maybe you have problem with the connection. We are not hearing you. William? No, it's not possible to hear you. Okay. I think no. I, my, my area now is very bad. Yeah. Now we are hearing you. Claudio, you, you are okay. muted. Okay, I'm saying that the case... Yeah. Hello? Sure, yeah. Okay. We, I'm saying that uh, we are beginning to see the cooperation between the Kenya Red Cross Society and our local authority, which is the county government. And uh, in our discussions, we've looked at how to uh, mobilize our resources, especially in terms of infrastructure and also personnel. So we, we want to see how we can put all that together, but we still have a lot of information and knowledge gap. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, William. Well, uh, we have uh, still four minutes left. And uh, before we wrap up uh, this meeting, I would like to share with you this uh, report. It's a short report that then I will circulate the details so that everybody can access this sheet. It's uh, a study that was conducted, a survey that was conducted on uh, World Heritage Site managers uh, in Europe, 58 World Heritage Sites were uh, tested. And there were questions about risk management and governance. I mean, disaster risk management governance, whether they were or not, and what, are the, what were the level of participation and understanding of the problem and so on. But the question, have you ever implemented a disaster risk management strategy before? 77% of these guys reacted the saying no. This means that uh, what we're discussing here is, uh, mm, well, 58 sites is not a big ratio. It represents 0.5% of the world heritage sites in, in the world. But I mean, uh, uh, it is uh, sort of an indicator, though, of the level of uh, understanding of the problem, the way of reacting. Um, this study is a study dated 2020. It's, uh, yes, 2020. And there are many other interesting data. It's very quick, but I would like you to have this important uh, piece of paper because it's uh, a place, uh, it's a point of the part, it's not uh, an arrival. It would be interesting to conduct a similar, similar uh, questionnaire and to circulate to other world area sites and see what is their reaction to, to make a real statistic that makes sense. Uh, said that, uh, it is 1658. I uh, wonder whether there is any last minute question to conclude this session. I suppose that uh, the presenters are. Thank you, Claudio. <laughs> You're welcome. So. Okay. Claudio? Yeah. Yes, I am here. Yeah. I was no, just no. trying to read the chat if there was some uh, something in chat because uh, you can fish in the chat sometimes there are very interesting queries that uh, escape to the eyes. But I mean, uh, I would like to thank, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing uh, authority in this, uh, in this uh, in this session, which is the University, the Catholic University of Chile. And uh, I would like uh, to, to thank them for the patience uh, that they were making a huge job of organization of contacts and structuring this uh, beautiful uh, mean that uh, is not at all uh, still dominated after one year of Zoom uh, with, uh, with the half of the world. Uh, then I want to thank to all the participants, 
but I want to give a special thanks to the speakers because some of them are really uh, working in uh, approximate conditions. Somebody has electricity, sometimes not. Uh, it's really difficult for them to report and I want to express a special thanks to them. And uh, this is not a, a adieu, but is a goodbye at the, next, uh, at the next opportunity. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank goodbye. you. Bye, thank you, thank, you. thank, thank you, very you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to add thank some you. words to the to the final thanks. Uh, um, thank you very much again to all the speakers and to Claudio to moderate and organize this session. Uh, tomorrow we will have another interesting uh, debate and session related with um, world heritage in general. And uh, the, um, the session tomorrow, it's preventing earthquake destruction in more heritage sites, learning from empiricism and regulations. It will be moderated by Marco Barrientos. And uh, uh, again, we will have uh, a great discussion with cases all around the world. Uh, thank you very much to all of you to join us and see you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.